No weapon that is fashioned against you shall succeed, and you shall refute every tongue that rise against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication from me, declares the Lord. Isaiah 54:17. Welcome, Tales of Glory listeners. Like, welcome back, my five listeners and a dog. We had some minor growth this summer. Glad to hear it. I'd like to welcome you back. And um, today we're going to talk about some interesting things here. This is kind of some off the cuff stuff. I am tearing down my studio because I'm refurbishing a lot of stuff in it. And it got cluttered and it got wired and wires were a mess. Now it's time to clean it up and make a real studio. And that's going to be my next effort over the next month or so to get this stuff rolling again. So, meanwhile, um, please. Uh, Forgive me for the clutter in the background, too. You see the bookshelves are all messy and everything else. It's just we're, we're tearing it down, rebuilding here. And cool stuff. So what are we talking about today? I want to talk about what spiritual attacks look like, common spiritual attacks, and how we misinterpret them and how we misinterpret the trials that come with them. Last um, Saturday, I was over with um, Bill George at the, um, the Freedom Culture Healing Rooms. He's a director there. And I, I spoke there on going deeper with Jesus during trials. And some of the themes I noticed that popped up with people were they were misinterpreting trials as they came. They thought there were deliverance issues. And they most grossly misunderstood the times we're in where the regional spirits and the demonic are just going berserk for collateral damage right now. And the church doesn't discuss this. We, we avoid stuff. You know, we focus all our money and time into the fog machines and the worship. And we miss the boat on what we Christians need to be doing right now is why we're in such bad shape. We're in we're getting beat up a lot of spiritual warfare stuff. And we're, church is turning to deliverance, but they don't know how to filter it and how to use it properly. I want to kind of touch on some of these things. By the way, speaking of worship... At the service I did, um, we're speaking at the uh, Freedom Culture Healing Rooms on Saturday. There was this young 12-year-old girl who led worship, and it was like the second or third time she's done it. She just wanted to start leading worship, and her mom was at the keyboards, and another guy from the church was on um, the guitar, right? And it was very simple, very raw, very beautiful. It wasn't perfect, but it was like, engaging real worship. I've had churches that, that post these banners like, we do the sort of worship that Jesus loves. It's like, well, how do you know that? How do you know he loves your worship? That's going to be in bolsters there, right? <laughs> it's prideful. But I've been at churches like, I don't know if you guys remember, um, the Free Evangelical Church back in San Francisco where um, I had angels anoint my Bible there with oil. That worship there, it was interesting because it was an old church with a 90-year-old pastor, and it was an old congregation, probably about 20 people in there, yet they're having angelic uh, manifestations happening during most of their services. And it was just a little whole new old church in San Francisco. It was, it was amazing. I remember, too, it was their worship team. Their worship team consisted of an old, I felt like an old Irish woman, probably an old Irish Catholic who became, <laughs> you know, um, charismatic was a keyboardist and one of the vocalists, and she had the high, thick Irish accent. And the man worshiping on the microphone with her was an Asian man with a thick Asian accent. And most corporate senior pastors, or they call themselves global, global pastors, global senior pastors now, would not have allowed these worship people up on their stage to do lead worship, just because it didn't fit their picture, it didn't fit the perfection. But it was so raw and beautiful, even though it was out of key, that there was angelic manifestations afterwards from it. I want to paint the picture here of what the supernatural look like, looks like and how it comes. It doesn't come because guys have these great Instagrams that are putting out movies about people throwing up in uh, movie theaters for demons being cast out. It's not because of that. In fact, that's the wrong road. That's in violation of Luke ten seventeen, where Lord, Lord, even the Spirit submit to your name. Because yes, I saw Satan fall like lightning. And I give you all the power and the earth trample of the scorpions and the serpents and all that stuff. But do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rather that your name is written in heaven. 
And that's where these pastors making these movies, making these Instagrams are in violation. They're rejoicing and being prideful at Spirit Smith their names. You have to operate in humility here. Many times the most powerful operations are little people you never heard of, who don't have any finances, don't have anything. They just go where God calls them to go, and they do the battlefield work. And that's just the way God wants it. God wants them under the covers. You know, He wants them. He wants them hidden. He wants them under the ground. And that's one of the ways I function too. I stay underground in battles and I do some very dark warfare. So I see lots of things like when I pray for people during like these healing services. I had one individual came to me said, um, you know, pray for her because she thinks her finances are cursed. And in this day and age, how do you tell if your finances are cursed? Our entire American finance is cursed. America is facing judgment right now under finances. And that includes Christians. We're allowing stuff to happen that shouldn't happen. We have people in political office that should not be there, and we sit quietly and not say a thing. And we wonder why our finances are under judgment. I mean, I'm getting beat up financially, too. It, it just God's going to blanket cover all of us. He's doing it now. I live in California. California's under judgment. Look at the San Francisco. It was a gorgeous city. I used to minister there for years. Now it's shutting down. It's been so overrun by the um, this false um, homeless scourge that the politicians created to make money off of that it's shutting down the city. Um, people are leaving or people are walking away from leases, huge businesses, and the city's facing judgment from it. And I know most America is too for the man in the office who's pushing out, Jesus pushing out God. He's breaking off covenant that America had with God. And so we're all under judgment right now. If your finances are messed up, start getting ticked off, get face down on the ground and pray for change in this country and pray for change in the, in the office out there that this man's selling us out to foreign nationals. We're already in exile. We're being thrown into exile because of this man. I don't need to do more in politics, but that's what's going on spiritually. This man has allowed spiritual, regional spirits, national regional spirits over our country that are taking control of things. Nowhere will be safe. If this country falls, nowhere will be safe in this country. There won't be little Bible, Bible built pockets because they stood and did nothing. They stood and did nothing. The evil knocked on the door. So when I pray for people about finances, it's like, you know, what are you doing about it? How are you fighting? It's This spiritual warfare has wrapped up horribly in the past couple of years. It was started off bad because I know more, um, spirit cooking was going on with Hillary Clinton. They're involving witchcraft and then it kind of backed off a little bit when Trump got into office. I'm not a big Trump fan, but I want him back. Better than we got now, right? Um, and then... When the illegitimate leader got in, the darkness came over again because he's pushing out God. He's pushing out God of the country. And we can't, we should not stand for this. We should be out in our streets protesting and screaming top of our lungs, this is wrong. But we're not. My thing here is not to be ideological about politics and stuff right now. What the issue is, is the amount of warfare we're engaged now and we don't get it. I'm a ministry that deals with the occult and freeing people from occult battles and occult curses, some very dark ones. And I get attacked all the time. It's constant here. And when I work with people saying, well, how do you find, how do you find intimacy with God? I'm not finding intimacy with God, Mike. How are you finding it? Because I find it in the darkness of the battles. Bad stuff hits. And with my ministry and with stuff I've worked with and saw the miracles I've seen, I have a trust in God. He's going to pull me through. But again, when witchcraft is flung this way, no weapon formed against me will prosper. Back to Isaiah, right? We're in the opening, right? Nope. It won't prosper. It's going to be mucky. It's going to be yucky. I mean, right after I did the um, healing rooms and we came against some witchcraft and stuff there and we prayed for some healing and stuff, like the very next day, my day went berserk. Over the past weekend, I sold off my, my iMac um, that I use for here for Tales of Glory for a recording studio. Because it was out of date, it was old, and uh, you know it was, it was an Intel, so it was time to get up to um, some new Apple, you know, processors. So I sold off all my equipment and raised the money to sell off my equipment to buy a newer machine that will they'll process this this video stuff better now and faster, and be up to date for the codex. And the enemy attacked me. I know we're we're hurting right now. I'm I'm looking for a job. Hardly any money's coming in. I'm doing some side side gigs and stuff. We're, we're preaching and stuff. It doesn't pro provide a lot of money. So we're hurting financially. We're bleeding money um, just from the family side. And we're cutting down whatever we can. So I know the wife got mad at me. I turned around and bought another piece of equipment. 
It's like I, I sold equipment to buy equipment, but it was for the ministry. And you know, so I got spiritually attacked for, you know, why didn't you put this money into stuff we needed? I know we needed it, but I also knew I couldn't use any money to upgrade. I need to upgrade to keep this podcast going. And so that caused grief. I mean, this is yesterday, right? It's just, it blows up yesterday. And it was like one thing after the other. And all of a sudden, I get a letter from the California um, Internal Revenue Service saying, hey, um, your accountant didn't refile for uh, your 501c3 or something. So some paperwork fell through and they were getting mad and jumping on me. So I reached out to my accountant, right? It's just it's just blown up. And <laughs> it just keeps going left and right. We had a, um, a good friend that passed away last night also, a good family friend of a long bout with cancer. And it was just hitting, hitting, hitting yesterday. And my doctor, you know, calls him and goes, hey, we need some more blood tests for me. Like, really? What else is going to, what else can you guys pile on today, right? Um, so it was a gloomy, bummy, bummer day. And just the fact that when I was butting heads, my wife caused a lot of tension, a lot of issues. And that was, that was spiritual. That was, that was the enemy doing it. I had to recognize it and walk away. And I understand her point of view of things that would happen. But like I said, this, this was money. It was ready for some podcast. And I had to go back into it. So that's why I did what I did. Don't need any explanation here, but even like the enemy's trying to shut down my um my job search. I went on several interviews and the enemy shut it down left and right. It was ridiculous what happened. I even lowballed some jobs just to get them to see what happened. A guy of my experience and then didn't get them. They fizzled. So if you want to talk about spiritual warfare, I'm gonna talk about where I'm at today. How do I have an intimate relationship? With Jesus, when I'm heavily bombarded by spiritual warfare, and that's what a lot of people don't get. I trust Jesus to pull me through. I'm just saying all this stuff right now because I know there's going to be praise reports in the next couple of podcasts. I'll report on this stuff. What changed? Ding. You know, what happened? What's changed? What's better? It's going to only be changed. It's kind of in the toilet right now. It is what it is. But God changes things, and I trust Him to do it. He has in the past. He's pulled me out some dark stuff, some dark battles. And I know I have a joke I call my intercessors. These are the, um, the occult people that are coming against me right now with the stuff where I'm helping other people because we've engaged battle against them. So when I have somebody come to me and go, oh, you know, they're, they're pleading. It's like a self-pity thing. Well, if God wants to help me and heal me, you know, I'm here right now. And you're going, oh, my God, you know, it's sort of a um, self-pity is this, this, right? You can't go to that when you're in spiritual warfare. You have to go to the place where you trust Jesus. I do it. I trust him. I always feel he's there. And during the, you know, it's like even yesterday, it just it attacks you emotionally. You feel it physically in your chest, in your head. And it's just horrible. And it can last for weeks. Some of that stuff has lasted for weeks. And you just peel it off. You stay with Jesus. You go into deep prayer. At the same time, I'm contending for a miracle. Like those of you who have been following me, we have a young woman who was um, programmed at a, older age, I think drugs were used, and I think they tried to hide what they did and put her in the mental ward, and somebody at the mental ward tried to erase her brain on it. And now we're slowly, over months, praying for her. Um, she was almost invalid. She could walk around and do things. Um, the family had to like feed her, you know, like with um, drinks and stuff through straws, and sometimes I use those um, We'll inject her syringes to draw stuff out of a smoothie, inject it into her mouth so she'd eat, and they'd take like half an hour to do that. We finally got to the point now where she slowly start to eat and feed herself. Um, she was in depends because she couldn't never remember to go to the bathroom. Now she's going to the bathroom and cleaning herself, and on occasion she's starting to take showers and clean herself, but then she goes back in that like semi catatonic, somewhere weird program state where the, the brain's still healing. So we're contending for a miracle for that while we go through all this spiritual warfare. And a lot of that spiritual warfare is being clung, flung from the people who know we're healing her, we're working with her. So it's heavy duty out here. It's I'm in a war zone. I know it. You know, your, your battle is not against flesh and blood, but against authorities and principalities and forces of darkness in heavenly places, dark heavenly places. That's where our battle's at. And that's why it says, therefore, put on the armor of God. Because we have to put on the armor of God because of what's over this country right now. It's being flung over us, and we have no control over it. We can't inter the intercessors and bind it and tell it to go. We petition Jesus and command it to go, and we fall down on our face and hum humble ourselves and beg Jesus for changing things. You know, I know there's a whole bunch of goofiness and stuff out there about this. You know, like the <laughs> the courts in heaven. That one's like. Why would you go attend a courts in heaven when Jesus is our intercessor 
and he is indwelling in us. And you speak directly to him. That's how I battle stuff. I speak directly to him. He changes stuff. We have walks. We have conversations. We talk about things. And you know, my day is really gloomy. I just talk with him and he reminds me about stuff that went well during the day. And that's what pulls me up. That's what the intimacy is. You know, when you're in a relationship, like I said, things go good. Things go bad during marriages, right? I know stuff right now where it's, we're butting heads because of finances. And we're going to pull ourselves out of it. But it's that turbulence that builds the intimacy and the deep knowing of each other of where we stand and to trust each other. And that's the same thing, how we build intimacy with Jesus. We go through the turbulence of life. We go through the suffering. We go through the illnesses. We go through the sicknesses as he pulls us out. Because the enemy that comes in and kills and destroys, he's allowed, the enemy is permitted to do this sort of stuff because it does in the end bring us closer to Jesus. That's how this stuff works. I know the charismatics always around going, bliss, 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 bliss. Oh, I'm in bliss. It's like, no, you're not. If we're living on the same planet, you're living through suffering too. So why do you put on this fake example of people, bliss, bliss, bliss? And people think that's intimacy with Jesus. It's not. Intimacy with Jesus means your name is written in heaven and that he knows you. Remember in Matthew, he tells the people, I know you prophesy in my name. I know you healed. I know you cast out demons in my name, but depart from me. I do not know you. That means you didn't have a relationship with Jesus what does that look like? It's just when you go through these struggles, these trials, you're talking to Jesus mentally in your head. And St. Teresa calls it like you're talking to your friend. I, like I talk to my spouse. I mean, it's Jesus, you know, he's the bridegroom is my spouse. So I talk to him like it's my spouse. And I trust him on what he gives me and information he gives me. And that's part of it there. Some of us don't know how to hear from Jesus. Some of us have a false hearing from Jesus where we listen to our soul. Again, that's a lot of the stuff I see in the charismatic um, universe there, the they listen to the soul and they have these stuff that just cheers them up and pumps them up right away. And it's something the soul fabricated. Usually we have to go through some long stuff. Like there's joy in the morning, right? I mean, that's some, right? There's going to be joy in the morning. We go through suffering. You know, when you're going to be engaged in battles of witchcraft, demonic, demonic possession, this is what it looks like. That's why, you know, Mike, I want to do what you do. Like you need to clearly understand what I do. I was brought into this by Jesus and I'm protected. And when I ride through these storms, it's not fun. And I have to make sure I'm doing everything I can to keep myself afloat and mentally stable when these attacks occur. And I'm in the middle of one right now. So that's why I'm broadcasting on something. What does this look like, Mike? What does it look like? This isn't meant to be a Debbie Downer day. It's meant to be, what do I do? You know, get into scripture, write up, read what's going on, what's, what's happening right now. So like during this time too, I know Jesus has also asked me to look at Second Kings with Elijah, and that keep that popped up to me last night. Like, what's going on there? So I'm just going to read it aloud with you guys to kind of show you what I go through, what I, how I think of things. Came in my mind last night. I actually had a hard time sleeping too. That's the other thing you get the joys of. All these things rattle your mind. You're up late night talking to Jesus late at night. Like, God, what's going on? When's this going to end? But excuse me, it was First Kings that came to my mind. First Kings 18 um, verses 20 through 40. That's what God put in my mind. And so I thought, well, I'm going to read this on the podcast, see what came on, and try to analyze this and kind of show you how my mind works when I go through this stuff. So let's read this. 1 Kings 18, 20 through 40. The prophets of Baal defeated. Oh, cool. We know where this is going. So verse 20. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I, only am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us, and let them choose one bull for themselves to cut in pieces and lay it on the wood. But put no fire to it, and I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you will call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first. For you are many and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. And they took the bull that was given them and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, 
cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is musing, or he is relieving himself, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. <laughs> and they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances, until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two seas of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, Fill your jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering on the wood. And he said, Do it a second time. And he did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time. And he did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. At the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that these people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell their faces and said, Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brick of Kishon and slaughtered them all. Whoa, some heavy stuff here. Interesting. So, when you're reading the Old Testament, this is kind of interesting. So, one of the things Jesus has been having me do in this season was to find him in the Old Testament. I kept getting this word in my, my head like, Jesus says, seek me, seek me, seek me in the Bible right now, seek me. This is back around January. And I go, okay, I'll seek you. I'll go start in John. And so, of course, he sent me to John. Yeah, something stuck out in the book of John, chapter 5. It was verse 46. Let's start in 43. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So yeah, so Jesus sent me on this little expedition to start extracting him from the Old Testament. He's everywhere. Um, some of you recall the account I gave um, one of the interns that worked with me through some of these um, dark battles with the ritual abuse survivors and stuff. It's totally turned her back on God. I mean, the, the demon chatter is intense. You have to be able to fight through this. I hear it all the time, too. Oh, Jesus is not real. Like, no, we know he's real. Back off. But this person that worked with me, I didn't know, didn't have the certitude of the um, Jesus was, was real. They went through seminary school, all this sort of stuff. They preached several places and stuff. They preached excellently. But I didn't know how weak their faith was, and the demons turned this individual away from their faith. And then one of the things was, well, Jesus wasn't in the Old Testament when they were arguing with me. Went, what? What do you mean he wasn't in the Old Testament? He's all over the place. No, he's not. And Jesus isn't even a Jewish name. Like, no, it's not. It was a Greek name, you know? So he's all over the Old Testament. So Jesus had me go back and look for him here. So it's no doubt that Jesus threw me over to Isaiah. Excuse me, not Isaiah. It was um, back to 1 Kings 18. We're seeing an event where Jesus sends in a prophet, Elijah, to prove to the people who are seeking other gods that there's only one true God, and he's going to do a power encounter to prove it. And this brings us back to what? Remember, some things always retroflect and hyperlink with each other. This brings us back to Moses and Aaron in Egypt against Pharaoh, right? Their hearts were hardened, and he's Moses and Aaron are going up against the Hakartamim, the, the Pharaoh's sorcerers. In this place, Elijah, in the scripture, 1 Kings 18, Elijah is going up against Jezebel's, or Baal's prophets, right? And they're the sorcerers. And God, what did God do? God shuts them down. Jesus shuts them down. 
And this is what he was doing when <laughs> Elijah told him to build a fire and you know slaughter their bull in certain pieces and however you do it and tell your God to light the fire. And then Elijah further mocks them by dumping water and putting water trenches and saturates his wood. He says, I'm going to call my God to light this fire. And he does. And he, after that, at the incident, he puts to death the, uh, the false prophets. The, um, or actually the sorcerers, the witches. He puts together the, the, the witches of, uh, of Jezebel. 150 of you slaughtered. So what's this telling me? What's God telling me here? He's going to do something supernatural to shut down the witchcraft. And he'll do it his way. It's back to, uh, was it Exodus 14? Let God fight your battles for you. You have to be in this place in prayer where you trust Jesus. You trust him. The bowels are flinging. I'm not going out there um, doing my St. Michael the Archangel prayers. You know, St. Michael Archangel will protect me. We see that in all the paranormal shows, right? I'm just in a place where I have a relationship with Jesus. And I'm, I, you know, it's like Esther approaching King Darius. You have to wait to be approached. You know, you wait on Jesus. And you approach him with you know, like this with your petition, like, Jesus, can you take this away from me? And he says, yes, and it'll be done. The king will do it, right? He's gonna, It will be done. That's how I work with him. And meanwhile, I just work on my heart and my pain and stuff, what's going on with him, and have very interpersonal conversations with, you know, what I'm feeling during the day or during my low spots. And sometimes I get hit pretty hard. Sometimes I get so hit that I don't want to dive into scripture. I don't want to talk to him. But you must persevere. You must pull yourself up and talk with him. And that's how we work things out. That's how we go deeper in relationship. So when this trial is over with, and yes, it's a trial, there's some horrible ones. That's how I go deeper in fighting bigger stuff. Sometimes when I engage some of this high-level witchcraft, they could tell that there's a person on the other side who knows who Jesus is and knows the power of him. High-level witches know the power of Jesus Christ. And they don't want to deal with him. They don't want to fight him. It's the low-level witches, the ones they suck into the, uh, I call it the gateway drug, like marijuana, is the white witchcraft and the, the little pagan stuff. They get sucked in thinking they're the ones that have power. And that Jesus is just another little Elohim like the rest of them. Nope. And as they go deeper and seek deeper power through greed and, you know, just like back at the uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil, they want darker, deeper stuff. And they seek it and they find out there is a Jesus and that the spirits they're working with submit and obey him, even though they blaspheme all the time. So that's something light bulb has to go in here on. You have to not just have a salvation prayer and go, okay, God save me. You have to start digging in deep and putting in time and effort into that relationship with him and talking to him. He does. He shows things along the way. Sometimes I hear from him directly, like last night, he goes, go read this uh, 1 Kings 18, 20 through 40. What he's telling me here is he's probably going to do a move on the witches. He's going to do a move that's going to be a power encounter. And that's kind of a, a heads up here. What's going to happen? When's it going to happen? I don't know. I'm waiting on Jesus and he moves in his timing. But I also feel too, this may be towards um, the individual I'm working with who is having a hard time having their brain functions working properly. I think once that person comes back into their state of mind, it's going to freak out a lot of those witches too, and they'll sense it. So they can no longer control her or do stuff and um, you know, access her, project thoughts or dreams into her. And that's going to be a very powerful movement too. So we're just waiting on Jesus to do stuff, and that's where we're at. We have to dig in. We're part of the fight. And we have to rebuke it when it comes our way. I don't attack principalities or anything. Because remember, like here in 1 Kings 18, these prophets, they were calling their high-level spirit Baal. And how they do that? They're doing they're cutting themselves, their own blood. They're sacrificing their blood to summon them. And you know, unfortunately, this all things are created for him by him, Jesus Christ, including that spirit Baal that was probably something was probably something on the divine spiritual council and it became evil. And so it was created by Jesus so Jesus can push it back and shut down its powers and do power encounters during stuff like this. That's what took place. So I know, I know from this that Jesus is on the move and he's doing something in the background. This is my reassurance. So cool stuff, huh? It's just, you have to dig in and like there's good days, there's bad days. You have to ride with it. You know, it's just, you have to understand where we're at in these spiritual wars. We're in some dark stuff right now, and I can't wait for the dark stuff to be pulled away. America needs to be America again, and church in America needs to wake up and fight this stuff, protest it, push it out. At the rate we're going, I mean, you don't have to be a um, the purple-haired prophet lady saying, you know, looking at this stuff with, you know, Bank of America just became digital currency. 
and the rest of the bank's going to follow. This means they're going to be able to control our currency. And this means the corporate churches that have been sitting with their heads in the sand, that the government will be able to cut off tithing to these churches and we'll be back to having underground churches again. And I bet you will happen within the next 10 years. American churches will be underground because of stuff the church has allowed to happen and we should have put our foot down now if it's not too late. We should be out in the streets screaming and protesting, you know, louder than the, than the ones we see on TV. Peacefully, though, right? We should be marching in hordes, not for Donald Trump, but for Jesus around the, the Capitol. Like, we've had enough. We've had enough of this. Bring, we want God back in the Capitol, and we want the, you know, we want better leadership. That's where we need to be. <clears throat> so it's a culmination of things. So if something is spiritually manifesting and looking at you and growling, yeah, go see the deliverance minister, get it casted out, or if you live in a haunted house, some spiritual stuff going on. Yeah, um, I would go see Deliverance Minister and have the spiritual attachments removed. But if you're dealing with finances and stuff you feel like you're cursed or, or you know stuff going on, I say to you, start digging in. Treat this as a trial. Treat it as a trial. That's how I treat all my battles. I don't let the enemy have anything. Like I said, uh, I spent a good 50 plus years dealing with a generational haunting. And I don't know how the curse came in. I know my my forefathers were came over in the 1800s where they were, and they were cowboys. And I have a feeling one of my cowboy ancestors severely ticked off an Indian shaman, and he got cursed big time with some shaman witchcraft, and it just embedded itself in the family line. I finally terminated it. It took it took years, um, decades. It was decades all through my family life until I finally, you know, and I was here out doing exorcisms, casting you know casting out high level demons and stuff. And meanwhile, this fight was kept coming to my my doorstep, and I was having to take it on one by one and just keep knocking them down, knocking them down. I never took anything to a deliverance minister because I thought, you know, this is not something cast out because it's not me. It's 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 something that's trying to attach the family line, and here I am standing at the forefront, you know, shooting back at this thing and, and driving it off. And a lot of witches showed up, a lot of shamans showed up, a lot of weird spiritual creatures showed up. We had skinwalkers show up in the, in the spiritual realms. We took them all on. One by one, it was like, oh, here we go again. And it, when it, the victory finally happened, all these dreams and stuff shut down. It was so nice. No more um, fly of the spirit into the spirit realms, dealing with these nasty things. I've only had one since then. I'm kind of glad I don't have them. I don't want to have them anymore. But also when I was working ritual abuse, during accessing, because my spirit understood fly of the spirit, God would put me to intercept some of these witch covens in the fly of the spirit and freak people out. That dude's a Christian. How's he doing that? He's not astral projecting. What is he doing? You know, it was a Holy Spirit. It was a fly of the Spirit. He pulled me into this stuff. And I had a similar incident with this um, individual I'm talking about recently where the spirits tried to access and come after me. Like, what do you think you're doing? And they met me face to face and it didn't go well for them. So I know they're, they're tossing the mojo a different way now, right? They tried to choke me out. And I went to Texas. <laughs> they tried to get some mojo at a restaurant. I'm with um, um, one of the women who hosted me from... Um, the Shift podcast, right? And the two ladies hosted um, me flying out there. And I went out to dinner with Megan and her family. And this is the first night. And I'm sitting there talking. This is like one day after those witches for the one woman I was working with tried to access me in my brain. I shut them down. So the next day, I'm out there having dinner. And it's like the spirit tries to come out during dinner and try to choke me out. Like I had to fight this thing. Like I got to go home. I got to fight this thing off. And <laughs> apologies to Megan. It was a gorgeous restaurant. Great food, like I couldn't eat. It was choking me out. It's like it's a demonic attack. That's cool. But meanwhile, during the dinner table, poor Megan's getting this message in her head, like, oh, I shouldn't have brought Mike here. It's your fault, right? That's the demons are talking to everybody around the table. And like I think other people got the same message. And the demons are telling me, Oh, Mike, you need to get back on a plane, fly home now. You're gonna have a heart attack. So you need to go to go to the hospital. You should get out of here and go to the hospital. Like, no, it's not. You guys are lying. You know, I knew which ones are which. So it took about an hour and a half to fight this thing off, but it was uh, uh, yucky and horrible. And then that was the end of it. So no weapon formed against you will prosper. I always say, I think that one attack that tried to choke me out, I think the, the the occult tried to summon a nuclear bomb in the spirit realm, and what got to me it was a sparkler. And I was choking on the sparkler fumes. And that's how no weapon formed against you will prosper. Remember, it's always in past tense. That means the weapon's been deployed. Jesus protect you. And a lot of the protection is just signs that Jesus can protect you, and the enemy's gone, oh my God, that man wasn't taken out. What happened? Because he's protected. So I want you guys to keep this in mind. As you do your stuff, there is no methodology. The methodology is get with Jesus. You just got to get in there and hunker down. If you don't know what to do, 
Go into your own space. Like we talk about the St. Teresa of Atlas, Psalm 4610, be still and know that I'm God. Still your mind, visualize Jesus, and go into him and just hold him and clutch him while you're being attacked. And have him pull it off. Let him do it. That's just the basic way of doing it until it comes off. It'll come off. We have to be in the battle some way or another, and it's not always through deliverance ministry. I think deliverance ministry is, you say it's, it's off its rails. There's reasons for it. If you're dealing with a haunting or dealing with demonic possession, um, excuse me, not possession, but demo, severe demonic oppression when the demons speak, I've had that happen too. Um, demonic possession is exorcism. It's Mark 9.29. But severe demonic oppression, where sometimes the spirits can speak or tell you things in your mind or talk to you and won't leave you alone or make you sick, then you need a deliverance minister. But you need to find the right one, not the one that's going to go through this. It's the water spirits are getting you now. Now it's the... You know, the spirits of this, the spirits of that, you know, a lot of this stuff isn't in the Bible. So why are we going down that route? And it's not even alignment with the second temple Hebrews understood demonology to be. And that's where I usually align myself to go back to what they believed. Because we've added our own mythology, Christian mythology circus, especially the guys that have the movie out. That's a Christian mythology circus going on right there. Avoid that with all costs. Who's the other one? The, um, the Apostle Catherine or something like those are just horrible because they were taught that. They were taught to do that, and they don't have discernment, and they haven't worked with dark cases. The dark cases I work with, will they'll try to take you out. It's very dark, and it's different. You have to know who your Jesus is, and your Jesus is the preeminence. He is God. He was the Word. In the beginning, He was the Word. He was there at creation. He, all things are created for Him, by Him. That is Jesus Christ. That's who's fighting for us. Jesus just didn't show up 2,000 years ago in the Bible through the birth of Virgin Mary. No, he came incarnate 2,000 years ago. But prior to that, in the Old Testament, he showed up, sometimes manifesting. He was the angel of the Lord, Malak Yahweh. Whenever God showed up in human form in the Old Testament, who went for a walk with, with Lot? We know from Jude, was it Jude 6, that Jesus delivered you from the Egyptians. That was Jesus out there in the desert. Jesus wiped out during the Passover. Jesus wiped out the uh, those people there. It was him. Who, in Genesis 3, was walking in the cool of the day? How does a spirit need feet and walk? Unless it's fully manifested, that was Jesus in the garden. Jesus was there with Adam and Eve. Start connecting the light bulbs. It's all there. It's all there. I think one of these days, uh, I have to do a lot of prep work for this one. And like I said, I'm having a hard time trying to look for jobs and getting this stuff done too, but I need to do prep work on Jesus in the Old Testament. I think you guys probably enjoy that. But we need to understand this, that Jesus always was, right? He was there with Moses, Malek Yahweh in the burning bush. The angel of the Lord appeared in the burning bush. Who's that? It's Jesus. He appeared there. He's all over Exodus. He's all over the Old Testament. He's in there. And it's just, you got to learn to read him and fight him. To find out who's there. There's some good things. Dr. Michael Heiser podcast. Excellent. Go listen to those. Go educate yourself. Those, um, those are great. Chad Bird's another one. Chad Bird has some great podcasts. I love listening to go listen to those. And that's where we're at. So anything else I want to cover and a lot of times too, we don't understand spiritual attacks and what they look like. Cause it's never covered at the pulpit because it's never covered in seminary school. So the pastor at the MDiv has no education on what spiritual attacks look like or how to prepare his congregation. I'll say, Mike, this this was common too. This is something that showed up over at, um, at Freedom Culture. I was doing the healing rooms and I was praying for this young man. He was freaking out. He thought he was going to hell because a blasphemous spirit was showing him blasphemous images every time he tried to pray. And he felt he was freaking out. He goes, I think I'm going to hell. I think I'm going to hell. No, no, you're not. You have a blasphemous spirit. I go, look. I told him, I went through a generational haunting. I had to deal with the same thing. It kept showing up in my 30s when I tried to pray. Horrible images, horrible things it was doing. And I drove it out in my car because I didn't know I had spiritual authority to make this thing shut up and leave. I remember I had a long hour commute both ways from my work back then in about 2005 or so, or 2004, maybe around that time. And I would yell at this thing. This is about the time Bluetooth came out, so I was able to yell in my car. So people thought I was probably on an angry phone call. Oh, there's some hot-headed guy chewing out his, his employees or manager at work or something, right? Something's going on there. And I was chewing out that um, blasphemous spirit to quit talking to me, never talk to me again, and leave. It took about 30 or 40 days of this battle in my car going on, and it finally broke off and left. 
finally broke off. And this kid was mesmerized. He's like, really? You had one too? Like I'm saying, you had one too? And I go, yeah. How do you think we learn this stuff? How do you think we learn this stuff is, is beatable because we have to beat it ourselves. And if I did it, the Holy Spirit in me and the Jesus in me, it's indwelling is the same Holy Spirit and Jesus in you. You just have to dig in deep and go after it. And most of all, learn to hear Jesus. I keep I'm pounding on the Mike Verkler book. Maybe I'll have to do a Hearing Jesus episode too. I didn't, touched it minorly in some of the um, uh, workbooks I put out from um, Carmelite Mystics and for Night Strike Outreach Training. Maybe you need to go a lot deeper and just do one podcast of basic hearing God and what it sounds like. I know we cover it a lot in St. Teresa of Avila, the voices we hear, right? We hear our soul. Our soul can make things up. We're designed to hear things through our soul. And there's God and there's spirit. So those are three things we hear from internally. So spirits can speak to us internally. It doesn't mean you're possessed or oppressed. That's the way it's always been. They can steer us and they can push our buttons by telling us to do stuff or causing arguments in our mind or causing arguments and relationships in our mind with people, stuff that really, really happened. And we have to be patient. We have to work things out. Anyhow, I hope this helps. I just want to say, because right now I'm in a, that low plateau, I know I'm climbing out. I wanted you guys to know, because when I work with people, it's always like, I wish I could be like you, Mike, totally protected. Yeah, I'm totally protected. But you know what that looks like? If I'm totally protected, I'm I'm at, I'm at in my battleship at sea, and we're firing guns left and right off this battleship. We are firing guns, and it's loud. And we know we'll make it through, because Jesus is the Admiral my Navy, right? And he's, he's going to give us safe waters. But to get there, it's going to be a lot of heavy barragement and firing the large guns on the sh- on deck. A few cruise missiles, whatever it takes. You get a safe, safe to travel. So if you're oppressed or you think bad, think bad things are happening or you don't know why you're not having that intimate relationship with Jesus, if you're talking to him while you're sick with some malady or something or some illness, you're in a hospital, you're talking to him, that's developing the deep relationship. And it's just... That's where it's at. You're going through some heartache or pain. I'll go for a walk. Like my, my heart's hurting and painful right now with some of the stuff that happened the past couple of days. You know, I lost a good friend and my wife was uneasy about what I did with my stuff. You know, it's like, it just, it just hurts. It's painful. But I'm going to talk it with Jesus. So I'm not going to get arguments with people. I'm like, okay, I'm not doing, why did this happen, God? Why? It's like, Jesus, man, this, this stinks today. This is not a good day for Mike. You know, like, I just want to hang with you and walk with you. That's okay. Um, yeah, just reach out and hold Jesus' hand. I'm going to walk with you. It's just, and, let the mind clear like yesterday too and when things went sour i went for a drive I have a conversation with jesus and i felt a lot better when i got back you know i was ready to explode and i go nope go talk with jesus calm down a bit and he brought me back in dialed me back in and that's where you got to be it's just it's there's no methodology to this there's no courses you can take you don't go off to a prophetic seminar and conference and learn hey this is how i learned how to talk to jesus and stuff like you can but it's not going to develop a relationship overnight it's it's through time. It's going through trials, going through horrible things with time. And Jesus takes your hand, walks you out of it. That's what builds a deeper relationship. You know, he's there. I have the certitude he's real. So when a demon's attacks, like, really? We're going there again? Is that all you got? I, I know he's real. My friend who's the intern who, who worked with me for SRA stuff, ritual abuse stuff, and she they let her talk out of her faith. She didn't have the certitude. She had high level of training in, you know, like I said, ministry and seminary training in she was gifted in her preaching, but she let the demons talk her out of the certitude that Jesus is real. He's not some imaginary friend. He's out there. He's real. And he dwells inside of us. And you have to learn how to reach him. That's why St. Teresa of Avila is so good. Her books, Interior Castle, she talks about the steps or the phases, excuse me, the phases we go through as we go deeper to Jesus who dwells inside of us. And the, the hardest part, like she said, is when you're talking to him, Initially, learning to pray, learning to develop a relationship, she said prayer is like water, and you have to go out to this old squeaky hand pump and pump like crazy to draw the water out of the well. And sometimes you're drawing the water out of the well, you get the brown dirt and then uh, the water, and then all of a sudden the good water starts coming up, right? And then you keep doing that, going out to the well, and, and sort of enough the clean water keeps coming up. And after a while, more and more as you pray and pray and pump at the well, eventually Jesus is going to start meeting you at the well. And he's going to replace it with a windmill, so you have to pump it. And so he's going to help a little bit with the, his resources. And the, the windmill is going to draw water. And eventually you get to a place where you don't need the windmill anymore. It's just misty all the time with his presence. 
and eventually you get to a place where, like at the tree on knowledge planet in the water, you'll you'll be taken to the water where it's a constant source of water. You never have to pump it again. This is what we're talking about. The last three were mystical experiences. And so eventually you have to pump your own well and get the calluses on your hands to learn to work the prayer. And that's like the first three mansions of St. Teresa of Avila. And the third mansion is where you become more advanced in prayer. So you have to start praying. You just can't do a salvation prayer and just take Jesus for granted. You have to go talk to him so he knows you. Jesus has to know you. And that's how you get your names written in the book of life. Not so much a salvation prayer. It's what you're doing to interact with him. And he knows me intimately. He knows how I'll foul up. He knows I'm, I'm, I'm fallible. And I know when I mess up or something bad happens and I need vindication, right? Remember in um, Isaiah, know what performed against you, that Jesus will vindicate you? I've had places where he had to vindicate me. I just kept my mouth shut. He had to vindicate me. He did. And so that's why I have this trust, this relationship with him. He's real. And I know I'm going to have, I'm going to have to do it later. When things start coming in better, I'm going to have to give some praise to the Lord on stuff I did here. Because I want you to see, but it takes time, right? Now maybe I have to go back to maybe five podcasts ahead or something like that. At my rate, like, hey, remember when we talked about this? Well, this happened today. This was fixed, right? I know. And then the attacks that the, the enemy uses with the, um, against my 501c3 all the time. You know, it happens once a year. I don't know why it happens. Like, oh, you didn't file this. Go, yeah, I have the scans. I sent them to you. Like, you know, right? We're supposed to trust the IRS and mail stuff. And then, yeah, if they don't get the stuff I mailed them, how am I supposed to expect them to get my, my election ballot if they, even the IRS hasn't <laughs> locked down this process yet? Right? Good times. So anyway, I rattled enough. It's just, I wanted you guys to see where I was at right now, what's going on, and how I think and how I look for stuff. And I'm with Jesus. So while we're getting bombarded here on the, the battleship at the um, M16 HQ, it's things are still moving along. I'm still alive. You still have another day, right? And it's just, things get better after this. So you just have to weather through it. And then something else hits. You're going along fine, and then something else hits, right? It's just... That's what it's like to be in this level of spiritual warfare. You just have to deal with it, and you have to be dug in deep with Jesus, knowing he's going to get you out every time. He's the guy. He's going to win the warfare. He's going to protect you. He's going to cover you. And things will come to an end, and you'll whatever miracles you're contending for will happen as well. But it's all hard. It's all hard emotionally and everything else. So I want you guys to get that. Don't need to render a deliverance minister. Is this something affecting you emotionally, financially? Is what's going on over the... The spirits of the airwaves right now, tune into that, understand that. That's how you battle it. And that's it, guys. Again, from the M16 HQ, I think the um, Hurricane Hillary blew over us or disappeared or what happened. We don't know, but never hit us. <laughs> so until next time, guys. Um, also, too, like I said, it's we're still working towards um, praying for being released to go to Vietnam. I had a, my friend there from Cambodia want to take me into um a jungle out there to do some power encounters with some witch doctors out there. And again, I have to be totally released for that to happen. And then possibly in January, I may be going out with Cindy McGill to do trafficking and work with women who are trafficked in the porn industry. And we go into there and I go with her and her team. But again, I, it's this stuff. So high level battles that as you can imagine, I only go if Jesus releases me. So I'm praying for that. So, but we still need finances right here too to keep the old bunker running. So I'd appreciate that too. And I know some people have, so love you guys and keep praying for me to get a job because I need to have that happen too, to keep the wife happy, right? Plus pay bills is getting ridiculous. We're hemorrhaging right now. So I got to get this going and have something happen. I just pray for something I enjoy. I actually praying for a career change. I was in IT. I'd rather get out of that, but I have so much technical skills and, you know, I want to try something new and something I'll enjoy. I didn't really enjoy that. It paid a lot of money, but doesn't anymore. Anyhow, guys, love you guys. Until next time, um, again, this will be on the field guide spiritual warfare.blogspot.com. If you guys care to donate, there's also a PayPal button down there you can donate to. And until next time, from the M16 headquarters checking out, thanks for tuning in. God bless you guys. Amen.